But the first thing, Mr. Gates, I want to know from you is um, people are associating you with health, uh, perhaps even education, mainly in America, but not with agriculture. But agriculture is very important for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Why is agriculture so important for you? Well, most of the poor people in the world, over 70%, are farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, they have small plots of land, uh, uh, very little information, uh, seeds that are very old, uh, not much credit, and uh, they're just getting by. And in fact, the variants that they'll have in the weather in the future will make things even tougher for them. Uh, getting enough nutrition for their kids is a very tough problem. Uh, and so we spend about uh, 500 million a year on our agriculture programs, including research and, and delivery activities. Mm -hmm. Is agriculture catching up? Is it getting more important even than health, for instance, for the Bill and Melinda Foundation? Well, the, the nutrition and health go hand in hand. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, so the, the relative size of the programs will stay the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every country that's uh, gone to prosperity actually does raise agricultural productivity pretty dramatically. Uh, and the beauty of that is it, it does free up labor, which is mm -hmm. uh, then available for other activities and makes food prices uh, less expensive, nutrition levels, calorie levels all, all go up, so you're unlocking the potential of the, the people. So it's been a necessary element yeah. in every move towards uh, prosperity. Prosperity, yeah. Um, one thing, one last question about health, and then we'll go to uh, Martin van Damme. Um, you're talking this, last, this morning about polio. You know, one of the major diseases still in the developing, sorry, in low-income countries. Um, you are, it's your aim to eradicate polio completely. When do you achieve that goal? <laughs> well, the, we've only eradicated uh, one disease ever, which was smallpox yeah. back in 1979. And now uh, we are on the verge of uh, making polio the second disease. Mm -hmm. uh, the campaign started back in 1988. Uh, our foundation has uh, recently been the biggest backer. It's something I spend a lot of time on. Uh, we're now down to two countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan, where we've had cases uh, in the last year. And we're hopeful that the last case will be sometime this year. Uh, then we wait three years, actually, until uh, we're absolutely sure. And, we, and they certify the eradication. So if things go well, uh, the last child will be paralyzed this year, down from uh, 300,000 when we started, mm -hmm. and by 2019, uh, we'll be able to redirect those resources to other health efforts like the eradication of malaria. Thank you very much. Mr. Martin van Dam. we talked a bit about ODA today, uh, Official Development Assistance. You know, the, the budgets are going down in the Netherlands, uh, and we have these SDGs the Sustainable Development Goals, that require a lot of money. And of course, the ministries of development, like here in the Netherlands, they cannot fund these uh, SDGs. Is there a task for ministries like the Ministry of Economic Affairs to help achieving the SDGs? Yes, but um, it starts also with the combination that we made in this government. Mm -hmm. um, between aid and trade, mm -hmm. because we believe that the most important part of development of developing countries is economic development. Yeah. Uh, and mostly it starts, as Mr. Gates uh, just mentioned, uh, it starts with development of agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot, of, um, a lot of small farmers in Africa form the basis of the economy there. And um, to give you an idea, if we continue to produce food in the way we do, like we do right now all over the world, in 20 to 30 years, uh, we have a huge problem. Yeah. But if we manage to produce food in the way we do in the Netherlands, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. then in 20 to 30 years, if we could export the knowledge we have, uh, export also the way that we uh, produce food to other countries, uh, for example, African countries, uh, we, could help to, we could help them to produce their own food, sure. uh, then we would be able to feed the world's population. Yeah, Of course, but this, this link between aid and trade or aid and economic affairs, went from the budget, $750 million, from the ODA budget. Are you are contributing some 
extra money to make it possible that uh, farmers or whatever in Africa can flourish. But let me give you an interesting example. And uh, I just heard, but I haven't met her yet, uh, that one of the owners of East West Seeds is here uh, today. Uh, what I learned from my uh, predecessor, she went to Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Myanmar could be um, uh, one of the most productive agricultural areas in, in Asia and mm -hmm. could help to feed other countries in the region. Uh, but there, uh, when it comes to farming, the first step is knowledge. It's just simple knowledge to understand uh, how to grow crops and how to uh, place seedlings in the ground even. Mm -hmm. East-West seeds there uh, is training people, training young farmers, uh, small farmers, mm -hmm. uh, how to do that mm -hmm. and to produce to gain a higher productivity level. Uh, it's a company mm -hmm. that's doing so. Yeah. And they're doing, uh, uh, they're doing it not because they're selling their seeds at that moment. They trust that their seeds are of will a quality, a high quality level, that they will gain um, income in the future. But here you see that aid and trade can go together. And that's what I strongly believe in. Uh, we can help uh, when it comes to knowledge. Uh, we could help even, I was in South Africa uh, myself at the end of last year, and what we actually did there is we helped small farmers um, um, that got small tracts of land because of the, uh, the land uh, division there. Um, and we helped them to start a cooperation because they all worked on their own piece of land, but they, uh, they lacked cooperation together. And with cooperating, uh, they were gaining uh, productivity levels, they were raising productivity mm -hmm. levels because they were working together and uh, together getting access to the local markets. So that's where we started with aid and we could help them further with trade when it comes to access to markets, access to logistics and even reaching bigger markets worldwide. What is your view on bringing those nutritional products to the people? Hmm. My mother always <laughs> believed in vegetables. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it, you're absolutely right. The biggest problem you have in poor countries is that you're over-reliant on just the cereal crop. And although it's okay to get uh, even up to 75% of your calories from the cereal crop, as you push above that, the nutritional uh, deficits are a huge problem. And so uh, there's many ways to increase that variety uh, with legumes, vegetables, fruits, uh, the most powerful interventions are where you can get a little bit of milk, eggs, or meat into the diet, which is why uh, we have a big livestock program, particularly getting chickens out to areas uh, that they generally haven't been available in and uh, improving chicken genetics, chicken productivity, uh, so that uh, uh, even the very poorest have that into their diet. Uh, Vegetables, we've done some programs in vegetables, uh, but more in the, the cereal crops and the cash crops. Uh, you know, we're very involved with what are called the CG centers, that uh, that's where the Green Revolution started. Uh, they have uh, the basic ideas, and they do public domain crops that uh, are always available without uh, any cost to the farmer. So it's very helpful in getting out to the, the very poorest. Mr. Vadam, you want to add something? Yeah, could I add? Because you said you, you do little in, in vegetables. I think it's um, very important in the coming decades. It's not only that we produce enough food, but it, that, that we produce healthy food as well. And uh, mainly in um, some African countries, that's going to be the most difficult part because of climate change. Um, so what we are actually uh, doing now is in the Netherlands, we started a group with several other countries. Uh, we call it climate smart agriculture. What we're trying to invest in is not only in seeds, but also in irrigation systems that could help out in countries that uh, suffer from climate change in the next decades, that they can still grow crops, grow vegetables and fruits uh, over there, because it should be, of course, part of a healthy diet in the future. So I think that's also a part where innovation is going to play a huge role in the, in the coming 10 to 20 years. Uh, so we are willing to, uh, to, to help those developments go further. Mm -hmm. Because we have a lot of knowledge, uh, but we're willing to export it not only for commercial reasons, but also because I think that's the way we should help the world feed itself in the coming 20 years. Completely clear. Um, last question for this row, then we'll go to the other side. It's you. Can you stand for a moment? Yeah, what's your name? Dina Boonstra. Mm -hmm. um, this afternoon we heard a lot of people um, um, questioning, the, uh, talking about the problems of bringing knowledge, services and products to remote rural areas. 
my late and very inspirational colleague on the board of uh, Cain Safee Tuberculosis Foundation, Tjub Lange, used to say, how is it possible that Coca-Cola can bring their products to every remote area? And with your um, experience in business, could you uh, help us how we can bring uh, knowledge, services and products to the remote areas? Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Gates. <laughs> well, there's... There's certain types of knowledge that are relevant in the rural areas. Um, you know, perhaps the most important is primary health care. And we're very involved in looking at the primary health care systems. There's some really amazing primary health care systems in very low-income countries. Rwanda, <coughs> Ethiopia, Ghana have done a great job getting over 95% coverage for vaccination, uh, dealing with pregnant mothers. And yet you have other countries that are even richer than those, like the north of Nigeria, where the primary health care system has broken down and uh, people don't, they're not located in the right places, they're not staffed well, you don't get the uh, goods there. Um, so there's a lot being done. I was just in Nigeria last week uh, when I, I spent a few days up in the north where we have partnerships now with six of the 18 states that are rebuilding that primary health care system. The other knowledge network that's interesting is for agriculture, and a uh, few countries like Ethiopia run very good extension systems, a few other countries uh, aren't likely to do that. So making sure that some combination of agri-dealers or co-ops, uh, information available through the cell phone, plays that role of letting them understand when they should plant, how to do multi-cropping, the benefits of new seeds. Uh, so there's a lot of innovation in ways of getting that knowledge out there. Those are the key things that you want to get out to the rural areas. Uh, digital connectivity over time, it's not a panacea, it won't happen quickly, but that essentially, uh, at least for knowledge transmission, levels the playing field because if you have access, then you know, the world of information is, is, is there through that data connection. Hello, I'm Michael Kimmerling from the Keynes of E Tuberculosis Foundation. <laughs> So I'd actually like to come back to the issue of global health and, mm -hmm. and uh, ask the question or, or the, the figure that HIV AIDS now has been recently overtaken by TB mm -hmm. uh, is the number one cause of death. So what is it that the global community needs to do around issues such uh, poverty related issues such as TB, poverty diseases, to overcome and have the same outcomes that we found with HIV AIDS in terms of addressing a global health issue? In fact, most people who die of HIV actually die of TB. So you can count it any way you want. It's that intersection is actually very, very large. The TB death number was uh, recently increased through in, uh, surveys that were done in India, Indonesia. Those numbers went up a fair bit. It had always been there, just that the, the, the quality of the data got improved a lot. Uh, HIV, TB, malaria, those are three diseases that we need new tools for. And we haven't had many new tools, but there's been a pipeline of drugs uh, that have been created through what we call the TB Drug Accelerator, uh, which our foundation funds, a lot of pharma uh, groups have been involved in that. It's tricky with TB because you do get drug resistant, you need a multiple drug regime. Uh, for DOTS compliance, uh, you need to go uh, a long period of time using those drugs and getting that compliance is very difficult. So getting drug regimes that are uh, shorter, uh, that are not subject to the current resistance and getting a vaccine, those are really uh, the key things we're funding. And we're very hopeful. Uh, there's some early uh, vaccine, including a construct called CMB that looks very promising. But new drugs, new vaccine, uh, better diagnostics, actually that'll come faster than the other ones. Uh, and you, you have countries like China that have done a very good job on TB. TB rates have come down very dramatically there while they stay, have stayed high in, in a few places like India and South Africa. Okay. Uh, my name is Marie Zublon uh, from Scope Insight. Uh, what I would like to know, um, I'm very happy to hear so much focus on agriculture. Um, and I already heard today in the, in the discussions there are so many good ideas of different organizations and companies. Um, my question is, how do you see us uh, moving into a more structural, more systemic change as a, opposed to the projects and programs that we have been doing in the past years? Well, the, uh, you know, we have models of success in agriculture. Uh, you know, China had an agricultural-led uh, uh, productivity miracle, as did 
Previously, places like uh, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, uh, really the Asian approach uh, with land reform, extension, new seeds, uh, that playbook uh, can work in Africa. And if you look at Ethiopia over the last 10 years, uh, as they've transformed their agricultural policies, uh, allowed a lot of innovation to come in, allowed agro dealers to come in, uh, strengthen their system. Uh, they are a model of what you can do with agriculture. And you look at what's going on with nutrition there, look, look what's going on with the economy, that's very, very positive. It's harder to do in places like Democratic Republic of Congo because the ecosystems are tough, the transport is very tough. Uh, you know, even getting inputs in, like fertilizer, means that by the time it gets there, it's very, very expensive. So, you know, we do need to be more systemic in terms of looking at uh, transport links, uh, which landlocked countries in Africa, that's always been a huge limiting factor. We can expect the coastal regions, with the possible exception of Somalia, to actually have pretty good economic growth over the next 10 to 20 years. And the last countries we'll be dealing with will be the landlocked African countries. Uh, and so, you know, some collaboration between the egg sector and the infrastructure sectors uh, will be very helpful there. But with the science of seeds improving as much as it is, uh, with the digital connections, with the role models we have, both from Asia and, and now Ethiopia, I, I'm very optimistic about uh, what we can do with the agricultural productivity. I think we're, we're basically on, on the right, right track as long as we let innovation go full, full speed ahead. I'm sure we can, um, uh, but the thing is, in, in most African countries, of course, uh, you have very small farmers, and you need, uh, we're going to need investments in the next 10 to 20 years if we want to uh, have a food production that can actually feed the population in Africa, and although the, the funds are not available. But the interesting thing in the technological uh, developments is that investments might get uh, smaller, uh, investment needed. If you can see now, uh, mobile phones are um, everywhere in Africa right now. Ten years ago, we probably couldn't imagine. If you see what you can do right now also with a mobile phone in agriculture, uh, I've seen projects in South Africa where they used satellite information uh, about um, um, the state of the crops and uh, about irrigation on the lands. Um, if you could make knowledge that comes from satellites available for small farmers, and they could use it using their cell phones if they have one, and they, if they don't have one, they will have one in a few years' time. Um, you know, if, you, if you could make knowledge available, uh, then it's also a reach of those small farmers. And I think the future of uh, African agriculture is still on small-scale farming. Uh, I think we have to keep that in mind. And knowledge and innovation could help, uh, but it comes sometimes on small uh, knowledge improvements or small innovations you know, even if you have a better seed that you put in the soil, you could have much more production than you do now. Okay.